Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I am president of the club and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome all of you club members and your guests in the audience as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Uh, before uh, introducing our head table, I would like to remind you all of some speakers we have scheduled for the next few uh, days. On Monday, September 25th, John McGaw, Director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, will present a speech entitled, The ATF in Partnership for a Sounder and Safer America. On Tuesday, excuse me, September 26th, Carol Channing, the Broadway actress and entertainer, will reminisce about her life and times. She's 74, if you can believe that. And on Wednesday, September 27th, President Iliescu of Romania will talk about his country, perceptions versus realities. Uh, transcripts uh, uh, and audio and videotapes of Press Club luncheons are by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. I'm also pleased to announce uh, the publication of the National Press Club's Best Contemporary Speeches, a book containing 13 of the best speeches made during 1994 last year. Uh, to a copy, you may call the same number, 1-800-NPC-2334. If you have questions for our speaker, you'll find some cards on the table, write them down, send them up to me, and I'll ask as many as time permits. And now, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I would like to introduce our head table. We have a very, very distinguished panel of guests here. Uh, our program today commemorates the ending of the most destructive war in human history, World War II with the signing of the Japanese surrender 50 years ago this month. Our speaker, General Paul Tibbetts, who will formally introduce in a few minutes, piloted the Enola Gay B-29 Superfortress that dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan to hasten that surrender. Most of our head table guests today played combat roles in the Pacific Theater. Most of them have to say also are members of the National Press Club. They are a sampling of a generation of young Americans who risked and sometimes their lives in that terrible war. We proudly salute them all. Before introducing our guest speaker, let me tell you a little about each of our the head table guests, and uh, I ask you to hold your applause until I've with all of them. On my left, Admiral John Hart, an associate member of the National Press Club, the author of two books, former head of the Federal Maritime Administration, and a retired rear admiral. Lieutenant J.G. Harley witnessed America's entry into World War II on December 7, 1941, when he won a Japanese attack from his hillside home at Pearl Harbor. John and his wife had to the dirt when a Japanese fighter shot up their house. John tells me that it was his PT boat, PT boat that shot down the first two Japanese warplanes at Pearl Harbor. John later went on to command the US Navy PT boat training school in Rhode Island, where he helped to select a skinny JG for a PT boat command. His name was John F. Kennedy. John uh, later headed a PT boat squadron against suicidal Japanese pilots in New Guinea, the Philippines, winning a presidential unit citation. As for the bomb, John says, uh, quote, I'm convinced it was to do to save American lives. Don Larrabee is a former National Press Club president, retired head of the Larrabee News Bureau. In August 1945, Army Air Corps Sergeant Larrabee was one of the first American soldiers to arrive in Japan, landing in Yokohama. Quote, says John, I took a carbine and a typewriter and didn't use easel either one. <laughs> he didn't need the carbine because on Emperor Hirohito's orders, 
Japan accepted defeat. He is typewriter because General MacArthur had not yet arrived. Without MacArthur, what else was there to write about, says John? <laughs> Frank Holman, an old friend, is a former president of the National Press Club and a former reporter for the New York Daily News. Frank was a counterintelligence staff sergeant in Luzon, the Philippines, when General, uh, General Tibbets flew his mission. mission, mission excuse me. Frank was part of the main U.S. assault force group that entered northern Honshu. Japanese troops, instead of resisting, lined the streets to assure a smooth arrival for the Americans. By late 1946, when covering President Truman for the New York Daily News, Frank personally thanked Truman for his decision to use the bomb to end the war. Says Frank, every soldier in the Pacific felt that way. Ed Prina is a former National Press Club board member and a retired correspondent for the New York Sun. Nice to see you again, Ed. Uh, during the amphibious landings in, in Leyte Gulf, Navy Lieutenant Prina survived the first kamikaze assaults. Six of the nine ships in Ed's groups were hit by the suicide planes. Meanwhile, the troops he helped put ashore faced an enemy that swore and did fight to the death. Ed had reason to suspect that something big was brewing in July 1945 when his Army Air Force buddies on Guam started taking bets that the war would be over within three months. At the time, the Admiral's staff on which Ed worked was making plans for a bloody invasion of the Japanese homeland. There is no doubt in Ed's mind that the bomb saved countless American lives. Edgar Allan Poe has written for the New Orleans Times Picayune for more than a half century. Per perhaps the biggest, thank you, perhaps the biggest story of his career was covering surrender ceremonies aboard the battleship Missouri. Edgar Island hopped across the Pacific as a correspondent for the Times Picayune during the final months of the war. As for dropping the bomb, he says an American invasion of Japan, quote, would have taken a lot of lives on both sides, Japanese and Americans. Ed is 88 years old. George Hicks is a guest of our speaker and director of Museum and Historical Services for the Greenwich Workshop. He is the producer of the Enola Gay video at the National Air and Space Museum's Enola Gay exhibit. He also produced the forthcoming documentary about the atomic bombing of Japan entitled the men who broke the dawn. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, Markson is with Media General News Service and chairman of our speaker's committee who arranged for today's luncheon. He also courageously watched every John Wayne World War II movie and is a historian. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Ken DeLecki is editor of Kip's Florida Business Letter and the member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon along with Mark. And Ken is a Navy veteran of the Pacific during uh, the War uh, Vietnam War and visited many of the sites of World War II combat in the Pacific at that time. Our next guest is Shirley Povich. Most people in Washington know Shirley. He's a longtime sports writer. A very distinguished one at the Washington Post, but what some people do not know, that during World War II, Mr. Povich was a World War, uh, was a war correspondent. During the fierce fighting on Okinawa, a Japanese mortar may have actually saved his life when it overturned a half-track, injuring Shirley. Shirley had plans to join his buddy, Ernie Pyle, on a, on a trip to a small island near Okinawa. The doctors, however, said Shirley had to be evacuated and treated for his injury. So Pyle went ahead with his plan, said goodbye to Shirley, and was killed the next day by a Japanese sniper. Shirley is the senior guest at our head table today. He's 90 years of age. He is, all, <coughs> excuse me, he is also the recipient of this year's prestigious National Press Club Fourth Estate Award for Lifetime Achievement in Journalism and he will be honored here in November for his service to our profession. Shirley Povich.
Warren Rogers, hold, all right, you'll get him. Warren Rogers Jr., another old friend, is a former president of the National Press Club, a syndicated columnist, and a wire service newspaper and magazine reporter. Enlisting in the Marine Corps on August 15th, 1941, Warren found himself within a year battling his way ashore at Guadalcanal, America's first main offensive in the Pacific. He was injured later while training for the bloody landings at Tar Tarawa, and he saw the end of the war as a newspaper man in New Orleans. His reaction to revisionist thinking about the use of the bomb runs from anger to amusement. Its use, he says, quote, was overwhelmingly logic in, logical in the context of our time. John Cosgrove is a former president of the National Press Club who worked for Broadcasting Publications Incorporated before becoming a commun communications consultant. John was an enlisted man on the bridge of a destroyer escort. I got that right, John? Destroyer escort as it fought off eight kamikaze attacks during the battle for ok Okinawa. His ship survived a hit, <coughs> excuse me, hit from the shore battery and plane launched torpedoes that passed under its shallow draft hull. John says the bomb came as a very welcome relief. Everyone who was on the battle line felt that way. Moving down, as soon as I can separate these pages, Joe Layton. Oh, man. Joe and I have been friends for 35, 40 years over here. And Joe is a spokesman, has been a spokesman for virtually every agency in Washington, including the White House, the Pentagon, the Treasury Department. If you ever want to comment, just call Joe. He'll give it to you. <laughs> But what you may not know is Joe, during World War II, was a war correspondent for Reuters. And Joe unknowingly received a tip from General Douglas MacArthur about the atomic bomb at the time. On the day that the Enola Gay rumbled down the runway at Timian Island, Joe and other correspondents in Manila interviewed General Douglas MacArthur on the upcoming invasion of Japan. MacArthur told them that, quote, some country is going to invent an, an atomic bomb someday. <laughs> and that will either end the war or end civilization, unquote. MacArthur had known about the bomb for two days. So there you have it. While Admiral John Harley witnessed the start of the war, Joe witnessed its end. He covered the Japanese surrender, as did Mr. Poe, uh, aboard the battleship Missouri, 50 years ago this month. And now, our principal speaker. Oh, yes, by all means. You can all stand again. And now, our speaker, Paul Tibbetts flew his first mission on the eve of his 12th birthday. He dropped candy bars from a biplane on patrons of Hialeah Racetrack, a promotional stunt for his father's confectionery business. Right? With that upbringing, it's not, it was no surprise that he became a cadet in the Army Air Corps in 1937 and a pilot in 1938. In August 1942, flying a B-17, he led the first daylight bombing raid over occupied France. He le then led the first 100-plane raid over Europe and was selected to be the pilot for Generals Mark Clark and Dwight Eisenhower during the North African campaign. General Tibbetts commanded the 509th Composite uh, Bomb Group, formed to drop special weapons to hasten the end of the global conflict. On August 6, 1945, he flew the first mission that, in his words, quote, was designed to convince the Japanese of the futility of continuing to fight. General Tibbetts retired from the Air Force in 1966 as a Brigadier General, having won the Purple Heart, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and other decorations during his 28 years of service. He has since retired from a second career as president of the executive jet company. 
He has two sons, five grandchildren. He and his wife live in Columbus, Ohio. Recently, General Tibbetts played a leading role in advising the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum on its controversial Enola Gay exhibit. Let's take a few minutes to watch a film from that exhibit. realize this was June. Uh, my letters to home, I'm telling my folks that I'll be there a year. I, this is what, what I thought. Now, I do know my friends that were in the Navy and that they thought it was a long war. They thought it was going to last at least another year. I think all of us at that time thought it was we were in for a long war and a dirty war, a mean war, and a killing war. Each island we got closer to Japan, the casualties increased. Now, the war went on and uh, was going on, and uh, you have to understand that during that period, uh, uh, people in the service were getting, were just really fed up with this. But under those conditions, if we could do anything to uh, significantly shorten the war or end it, why, I think anybody would have jumped at that possibility. We can talk to young people, Talk to, explain it to them and things, but until they've been involved in it, they just can't understand what a total country effort this was. The war was, and everybody was involved in it. Not just the people in the service, although that involved just about everybody between the ages of 18 and 35, but the people working in the home front, building airplanes, building tanks, building weapons of war. That's all it was. We're in General Ant's office, and he is instructing me as to uh, my assignment, you are going to organize and train a unit to drop these atomic bombs simultaneously in both Europe and Japan. And uh, he told me about my using my, uh, uh, word, my, my code word of silver plate and cautioned me. He said, Paul, you got a tremendous amount of responsibility there. You got a tremendous amount of authority. Be careful of how you use it. I was never challenged. Nobody ever asked me, uh, can I drop the bomb? Or, you know, have you made a decision who's going to drop it? If they had, I'd have told them, yes. Decision was made the first day I heard about it, and that's going to be me. Paul told, told us we were going to drop a, a new type of weapon. He said that if anybody wanted to back out, nothing would be said. Nobody backed out. I was brought into the radio shack. You're supposed to be Colonel Tibbetts' radio operator. How many hours have you had in the air? I said, 10 at radio school. I was naive. So I didn't know what I was supposed to expect. Wendover, Utah appeared to me when I got there as the ideal location. Isolated out on the Nevada state line, on the salt flats of Utah, and uh, there wasn't very much there. There was nothing to attract any particular attention out there, and I thought, this, this is the place I want to be. It would be easy to keep the secrets in the Wendover. Nobody ever mentioned the word nuclear, nobody ever mentioned the word atomic, we just knew it was going to be a big explosion, uh, a lot of destructive force. During the bomb uh, runs and tests, we were trying to get the ballistics for the two weapons. For the airspeed, you'd have to put in a different drift. You'd have to put in a different uh, trail, which is uh, how the bomb where it comes out from behind the airplane. But it took me, uh, I'd say, two to three months with the background I had to actually uh, realize and believe that they were actually uh, onto something as big as I'd heard. Because with my background, as far as me to visualize it, one bomb could do what they said. 
my organization, the 509th Composite Group, was ready to go to war by the month of May, 1945. And I sent the word in to move the 509th organization overseas. I wanted them to get shot at. I wanted them to experience possible emergencies and everything before they had an atom bomb in their airplane and were really playing for teeth. I wanted the Japanese to see individual airplanes. I wanted them to think maybe that most of those single airplanes that they were looking at were reconnaissance airplanes, because they weren't interested in reconnaissance airplanes at that time. Hiroshima was definitely a military objective. It was also the place in which they were assembling all of their military equipment to resist an invasion. We were given uh, information about air sea rescue units and uh, what we uh, uh, would do in case of trouble with the bomb, trouble with the airplane, uh, trouble from enemy action. Had the final briefing at, uh, at midnight, followed by then the breakfast and down to the flight line. You knew it was big. You know, it was a. Uh, it was going to be a big one, and so you were. Uh, uh, I think uh, you were at a level a little higher than you do on a conventional mission. The uh, biggest part of that after the briefing was coming out to the aircraft and seeing this tremendous amount of people around it, uh, Klieg lights with uh, shining all over the airplane. Uh, a big crowd of people out there. You know, you were the center of attention. You were the monkeys in the zoo. And I was sitting there in, in the seat ready to start engines. And of course, uh, some of the cameras were still out there. And I stuck my head out to ask them, please remove the cameras and the, the floodlights and all that so we could start cranking up. And at the same time, somebody yelled at me and said, hey, wave at us. Everyone, to the field! I had a bunch of lives on board this airplane that I had to give careful consideration to. And in that regard, I couldn't help but reflect on Chaplain Downey's prayer. We pray thee that the end of the war may come soon, and that once more we may know peace on earth. May the men who fly this night be kept safe in thy care, and may they be returned safely to us. We shall go forward trusting in thee, knowing that we are in thy care now and forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I watched the airspeed indicator go past 160 that night, and we were still on the ground. Those wheels were turning. But I was confident that this was the only way to do it so that I could control with the tail if I had to. So when I'm going down there and I kept it past that magic 140 that you knew it was used to, he started to grab the yoke and pull back on it. He said, lift it off. And I told him, I said, keep your damn hands off of that yoke. I'm flying this airplane. Weather was very clear. We could see uh, the coast of Japan from probably 75 to 100 miles away. And I, then I went up and looked over Tom's shoulder, and uh, we took, compared notes in the city and made sure we had the right target and uh, picked out the bridge that was the aiming point. And then I went back and sat down. And uh, it was in the bombardier's hands at that point. Well, after flying as much as I had in Europe and planning missions from the very start, uh, I knew a lot about picking up aiming points. It's something that I. I could pick up as a bombardier real easy. And that uh, the bridge that I picked out was right in the, almost in the center of the city. Made an ideal aiming point. And then for five minutes, I was watching his head there and he was looking at me and chewing on his cigar. And he said, ain't a damn thing I can do. Nothing, it's going right down the track. And he'd look up at the bomb site. It's on course. And it was on course until it left the airplane. <laughs> Oh, I raised up a little and looked out right out over the nose, and Paul immediately started to turn, but I could still see it, because I wanted to make sure it was clear of the aircraft. Thought I'd had some trouble with some of that tumble here that I was, uh, when I was, the window was dropping them. So 
So I wanted to make sure it was falling clear, and it was. It was going straight in. And we were still pretty close to it then, the mushroom cloud. It showed the cloud rising to about our level, uh, which was in the neighborhood of 33,000 feet, if I remember right. And uh, it also showed the turbulence engulfing the city and moving out into the foothills. And the only thing that I could see of Hiroshima was one of the docks and the bay. Colonel Tibbetts, will you tell us some of your reactions over the target? Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am really happy to be here today to talk to you about a most unusual type of an organization. Now, the purpose of this film was to acquaint you with some of the key things that needed to be discussed about this organization. It was produced by a group of people that wanted to give us, those people that flew the mission, an opportunity to tell our story. We've been able to tell our story before. Whenever we were interviewed, it was always to specific questions and answers were directed to certain things. So now we are telling our story. I would like to begin by telling you that in this program this afternoon, I have been offered the opportunity to answer questions after I finish talking, and I welcome that chance. I hate to tell people things that they don't want. I'd much rather tell them what they would like to hear, and that's, that's the way we get the opportunity to do that. The 509th Composite Group, when organized, was a unique organization in that, number one, as commander, had no boss. Now, can you imagine a 29-year-old colonel with all of the responsibility they delegated to me, and I don't have to tell anybody. I have nobody to ask what I should do or anything. I was told, it's you, you're on your own, as General Lynch said. He advised me, too, be careful, because I might wind up in prison. Well. Thank goodness I don't have to say that I did that. Now, what I'd like to say is that in this project, what gave me so much authority was the word silver plate. I was to do things under normal circumstances using normal chain of command channels. Now, my chain, I told you I didn't have a boss. My chain of command was to General Ent, and he handed it to somebody in his staff that forwarded it on as it were for the second air force this way security could be maintained and if one of those requisitions for some piece of material or what personnel or whatever it might be if they were turned back dishonored i was to get the thing it'd come back to me i would stamp a silver plate and then send it to washington direct to a man up there that had outside of the uh, general office who had been designated as a person to receive these. He briefed on what I was doing. I think he was one of the very few men in the Pentagon that really knew what the 509th Composite Group was doing. I only had to use that silver plate one time because when I took over the organization, I didn't have anything. So General Ant first gave me a list of, of bases, three of them to look at, select the one that I wanted. He had to, Earmark a B-29 squadron because he knew B-29s had to be used. And he said, Paul, go look at the air bases. Tell me which one you want. Go look at the squadron. If they don't suit you, he said, I'll, we'll look around some more until we find the do. I did just exactly that. 
The first base was Wendover, Utah, then Mountain Home in Boise, Idaho, and Great Bend in Kansas. I flew from Colorado Springs to Wendover. That was the quickest trip. And as I flew over the hills there and got my first look at Wendover, I remembered that he had said that Bob Hope, when he arrived there for a USO show the years or so before, he said, it's leftover. <laughs> well, this was wonderful for as secrecy. It was easy to keep people away from it because it sat out there on the salt flats, almost salt flats. Nobody could really, let's say, sneak into it. I had a very powerful company of military police, and they were people that were on the ball. So, okay, fine. My next look was at the squadron. And when I looked at the squadron, I was quite well pleased. I would have to tell you truthfully that as I saw people coming out and getting on B-29s initially in the early part of the year, uh, I wasn't real happy with their training because they had been taken from school, from just the primary school teaching their specialty, and had been put on the crews of airplanes to fill positions. And the reason for this is that B-29 had been earmarked for Chiang Kai-shek as promise of President Roosevelt. He had told Chiang Kai-shek that we would have airplanes over in China in late 43. Now, with this admin of being over there, what happened was we had an airplane that had been ordered into production. Nothing had ever been tested on it. And I mean nothing. And we put crews on it that didn't know anything about it. We sent them to an area where the airplane was able to get by, probably on the skin of its teeth, if I can use that expression. It stretched that airplane to the limit because they had to supply themselves, meaning they had to fly back into Pakistan, make two trips to get fuel enough to make a flight out of, uh, out of their base in China and uh, make a strike against the Japanese. It was a f really a sad attempt. Now, I had learned all of these things by reason of the fact that when I came back out of Europe, I was put onto the B-29 specifically to help find cures for some of these problems. I was more experienced than anybody else. In a word, the airplane really had a lot of potential, and somehow or other, I saw that. And the flight in it that I do for about a year, a little over a year and a quarter for that, let me get into a position. I knew that airplane and knew it well. So, okay, now I've got a special project. I've got to get airplanes that can make that flight. The B-29 is the only one that could do it because it's the only one physically large enough to hold a bomb. I learned this from the Los Alamos people. I had reasonably good contact with them all of the time. And they were might, mighty well interested in us by reason of the fact that you know, their success depended upon us, and that's the way it got to be. I said later, and I would say it again, that Oppenheim and Groves were probably the original odd couple. General Groves hated skinny men. He hated men that smoked. Oppenheim was very skinny, chain smoker. Oppenheim, he didn't like fat men. <laughs> Groves was rather healthy. He had a bad habit of eating chocolate all the time. But okay, now I said, okay, here comes Tibbets. He's the third leg of that stool. They depended upon me to be successful. I depended upon them to be successful. They had to produce a weapon that I could drop, and I had to drop it successfully to make them a success. So I think that that's about the best analogy that I can come up with on that one. When I had gotten into the month of December. I was pretty well sure of what I wanted to do. And when I say sure, I have to say I was really confident because at 29 years of age, there wasn't anything I couldn't do. And uh, so we started out, and I, I ordered my B-29s. Now, one of the things, that I'm not sure whether I made it clear in this clip or not, but one of the things that General Ant told me, you have to be self-sufficient. Well, what does that mean? I could not rely on any other branch of the service to do things for me, because they would be doing things that were taboo to be known about. Moving scientists, moving particularly 
critical parts of, of uh, plutonium and those type of uranium and all those things that has to go had to go to Los Alamos to go into the bombs. I put in a special request for five C-54 airplanes. You, some of you men will know what that is, but that was the first real four-engine transport type plane we had built by Douglas, commonly referred to as the DC-4. I put requisition in, and in a matter of a few days, it came back disapproved. I put a stamp on it. Now, I had to go to Washington for another purpose. I put a stamp on it, carried that to Washington with me to this gentleman who was the man that's supposed to see this, uh, the, the disapproved uh, requisitions. It has silver plate and big print, almost, almost inch letters. And I told him the story. And he said, well, why don't you go down and talk to that Brigadier General that turns you down? I'm not going to name any names. It didn't worth it today. But that Brigadier General had refused it. So I took my requisition, and I went back and got an audience with him. And, and he said, oh, you back? And I said, yes, sir. I said, uh, you disapproved my requisition. And I got an important job that I, I've got to, I got to have those airplanes. He said, well, he said, Military Air Transport Command, Troop Carrier Command, they got important jobs too, and they're going to get them, not you. He said, what are you trying to do? He said, I just gave you 15 B-29s. You want to have the Tibbetts First Individual Air Force? <laughs> I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, well, get out of here. You're not going to get the airplanes. I went back to this office, told the story to this colonel. He said, you got something else to do? And I said, yeah. And I, he said, you going back to Wendover? And I said, yeah. He said, go back to Wendover. And I said, fine. Well, a day and a half later, my phone rang in the office, and he said, uh, this is Bim. I said, what's got? He said, you got a pencil and paper? I said, yeah. He said, uh, get ready to copy the serial number of your airplanes in the day of delivery. I said, thank you. And he gave me five serial numbers, five dates for delivery, which were right. I said, Bim, what happened? He said, well, you know, General Arnold had made this comment that they had to honor him. I said, yep. He said, well, when he had his staff meeting yesterday morning, he told the director of operations to bring this general into the process, into the meeting, and he had his aide have this man come in last because his habit was every general to step through the door of the Arnold would say, good morning, General so-and-so. When this man's turn came as the last individual, and he stepped through the door, he looked at him, he said, good morning, Major. <laughs> he said, this man just, he just turned down. He dishonored a silver plate requisition. He said, I said, once they would all be honored. He said, I don't think I need to report it again. And that's exactly what happened. That's, that's, this means that they were serious. Uh, Quite an experience for a young fella. <laughs> now, as quickly as I can, I want to tell you that that outfit was ready, to, close to being ready to do business in January and February, because I, I was more concerned about anything with their ability to navigate by the stars and by the sun. They didn't get much of that in, in, in their navigation school, because out there over the Pacific, they were either going to be flying in the sunlight or they are going to be flying in the dark, and there weren't any markers on the ground to tell them where they were. And we used Batista Field in Cuba for that particular purpose. Now, before all this had happened, I told these crews that they had to be able to fly 25,000 feet, drop a single bomb, hit within 500 feet. They had to navigate at night by the stars on lake triangle legs of 300 miles. They had to close the triangle with no more than a half a mile uh, to make the closure. They said, you can't do it. <laughs> I said, we can. So uh, I got the squadron navigator, the squadron commander, and the squadron bombardier. We put a bomb in our airplane, an ordinary iron bomb. We put an iron bomb in our airplane, and we took off. Farabee, Van Kirk, myself, and my crew, we made this trip. When we got back, we did everything that we were supposed to do. First off, we had to close the triangle and then go to the bombing range about three miles away. And uh, we closed the triangle. Uh, I, Van Kirk says, and I have no reason to doubt him, he said, oh, fair, we were just about 
a hundred yards off in closing the, it was the runway at, at Wendover. He said, we're just about a hundred yards off. Farabee dropped the bomb at about 300 feet in, uh, from the exact aiming point. We went back and landed, didn't say anything more, and next thing I knew, the competition was great. The motto was, be, let's beat the old man. And it created a really a competitive outfit. It welded it together like nothing that I've ever seen done. A, letter, a word or two on security. I'd like to say that on the island, I did have a commander. I was assigned to the 315th bomb wing out there. And with that commander being there, he was interested in what was in his command. I can't blame him. But in order to get on my airplanes, you had to have a special pass. And my memory today is a little bit faded, but I think that was the yellow pass. We had a yellow pass, a red pass, and a white one. Now, a white one was used to wind over to get just to get on the base. The yellow pass would get you on line, and the red one would allow you to get in the airplane because they didn't want anybody looking in there and making any mess or fiddling around and all that sort of thing. This general, big man, PG, likable man. One day, he decided he wanted to look at one of those airplanes. He drove out to a revetment, got out of his car. There was a guard on each airplane. He got out of his car, and a guard challenged him. He said, halt. And this man said, well, I'm General Davies. I'm division commander. The guard said, yes, sir, General, I recognize you. He said, I want to look at that airplane. He said, the guard said, you got a yellow pass? He said, no. He said, I don't need one. He said, General, you need one to get on this airplane. And he said, well, here's my AGO card. And he threw it toward the guard's feet. And uh, the guard looked at him. He took, started to take a step. He had one of those, what was those uh, small automatic weapons? He had one of those in his hand. And he lowered it at the General's stomach, cocked it. He said, General, one more step and you're dead. General got back in his car, got his, to his office about as, about as quick as he could. He, he called for me to come up there and uh, told me what the story was. He said, uh, would that man have shot me? I said, there's no doubt in the world he would have shot you. He said, I thought so. I was reading I got in the car. <laughs> well, we, we, got that, we got that done. Let's get down real quick. We're on the island. You want me to slow down or speed up? Speed up. Okay. <laughs> I'm out of time. Okay, you've seen how the mission went. We got ready for that, following the procedures. And we made a very successful move. We bombed the thing just exactly like it was supposed to be done, uh, being 15 seconds off of the time specified. And with that, we turned around and came back uh, to Tinian Island, where you saw us making our final approach. Thank you very much. Well, let me ask the, the, the question that a number of people ask uh, in different ways. Uh, a, a direct question. Do you think President Truman needed to drop the bomb in order to hasten the ending of the war? And do you today, uh, 50 years later, have any regrets? And the third part is the same thing. One of your crew saw the cloud and wrote, my God, what have we done? Do you ever ask yourself that question? Going backwards, somebody wrote that one of the people said that. I didn't hear it, and I really don't think it was said. I can tell you truthfully that I did and a couple of the other guys, when that thing exploded and we got a chance to look at it, we used a couple of, what do you call them, cuss words, expletives, and so forth, and one of them contained the word God. And uh, that's about the only thing that I can assure you that we did. Uh, the other uh, part of that question, uh, Truman had told. General Marshall, which filtered down to us, that we were not to drop a bomb until he told us to. Now, you know, he went to Potsdam at that time period. When Potsdam was finished, he was on his way back, taking Winston Churchill on a cruiser to Britain, and on the way back, he sent word to Tinian, or to the White House uh, radio room, which was relayed to us, Tinian, on a, uh, a teletype wire, and which said, you're authorized to use the weapons. 
Now, do you think he was justified? Oh, do I think it was absolutely, but let me tell you. And now, it was never my, any doubt in my mind it was just justified. I mean, look, at we begin to know the numbers. Look at all the sacrifices that the Army, the Navy, the Marine guys made out there. See, we didn't win this war by ourselves. We had all kinds of help. And I didn't think that killing, you know, four or five times Okinawa would just justify holding that bomb back. No, it didn't, it didn't do it. We were justified. I've never to this day regretted it at all. All right. Now, uh, a questioner asked why were there just two bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Why not more, a dozen? Well, let me, and let me answer that this way. Everybody really thought that they'd quit, and I did too, with one bomb. Later, we learned that they, the Japanese thought that that was the only one we had, and that, okay, they'd already taken the hit. Why, why worry about another one? So after waiting three days, Sweeney was launched to Nagasaki with the second bomb. Unknowns to them and unknowns to anybody on the island except myself and, and uh, Admiral uh, Commodore Parsons by that time and, uh, and um, his, his people out there, there was another weapon in the United States. And that weapon could be made ready to go in less than 24 hours. I had an airplane back it went over that could have ferried it out, gone, to, gone down to uh, Kirtland Field and get it, which they did do, because LeMay said, get that thing out here. And when he said that, he said, get your crew ready, because you're going to fly it. And so when they got with Moffett Field in California with that weapon, the Japanese had capitulated. Some uh, revisionist historians claim that the United States never really intended to invade Japan and therefore the claim that so many lives would be saved was sp spurious. Do you, can you uh, uh, refute that? I cannot tell you that I knew anything about that so-called saying, but it seems utterly ridiculous to me. I don't know how anybody could come up with a, a, a conclusion of that particular type. Uh, everybody that I knew was wearing a uniform. They were fighting a war, and they didn't believe that the Japanese were about to quit or anything else. So uh, the third thing was, again, we didn't have too much I mean, uh, uh, uranium to waste. They were taking six months to get a fourth bomb. So you only had, uh, we only, we had three supplies that, for three. And we only had, at that time, we only had material for three. For three. Uh, isn't it so that uh, uh, after you dropped the two atomic bombs, that, in fact, on the day that Japan surrendered, August 14th, that there were 600 B-29s in the air already to continue the bombing with conventional weapons. Well, let's put it this way. In the hours of darkness, they were in the air because that no word had been gotten by that particular time. So it was, the hour, it was the, in darkness the night before, if you want to use a calendar. Why was the bomb detonated in the air above the city rather than after hitting the ground? The physicist at Los Alamos had calculated that the diameter of the file bo fire bomb, uh, ball emanating from the explosion would be 1,500 feet in diameter. They wanted it to explode at 1,500 feet as close as we could get it so that they'd get the maximum coverage of the surface with the, fire bo with the fireball. After World War II, did you think a nuclear war might be imminent? I did not. I tell you what, truthfully, I told my, I, I got ordered back to the United States ahead of the organization because I was supposed to get back here and participate in a, something that was coming up, it was going to be the bikini bomb test. And I, the guys asked me to make some kind of a statement before I left, and uh, I did. Uh, I got up in front of the, the group, and I told him, you will never see another war like this one, you'll never, meaning you'll never see mass formations of airplanes fly. And I said, I don't think that anybody in their right mind is going to take a chance on having one of these weapons used on them. And that, so I, I don't think, okay, we're 50 years later and so far I've been right. My other point is not asked for. If we maintain the strength that we should maintain, if we came to the will to do something, God damn it, we won't have one. Uh, 
After dropping the bomb, did the Enola Gay experience severe turbulence that threatened your safety? It did not threaten any safety, I assure you that. Uh, we had been told. I had asked Dr. Oppenheimer, what can we expect when this thing explodes? He said, well, he said it's going to explode to the equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNC. I said, okay. Now you know and I know we can't fly ahead when we drop this bomb because we'll be right over the top of it when it explodes. He said, oh no, you've got to get tangent to it, the shock wave. Well, I'd seen, I'd had some trigonometry and physics and a few things like that. I said, what's tangency in this case? He said, 159 degrees. Turn 159 degrees in any direction as rapidly as you can make the turn, you get away from it. The, air, the estimated effect on the airplane at seven miles was about six G-forces. We were 10 miles away from it when it did explode. We had accelerometers in the airplane and we had a two and a half force hit the airplane, two and a half G-force. That was well within the safety limits of the airplane. The airplane was stressed for nine, nine, nine G's positive, three and a half negative, upside down. Many people consider strategic bombing a euphemism for mass killing of civilians, as in the firebombing of Tokyo, Hamburg, and Dresden. Why is that not a war crime, as it would be with ground forces? Okay. I've heard that said many times, and the idea is it is not intended to kill uh, civilians and women and children, but I would ask you to take a look at this. Let's supposing that the Japanese or the Chinese or the Russians or anybody else had a, a bomb, where do you think they would use it first? I'll tell you right here. If they didn't, they'd be of General Motors up in Detroit area. The men that man the factories, the men that run the government are right here. Their wives and family are nearby. The bomb is non-discriminating when it goes off. That brought into, that came into clear focus when the British started bombing and the Germans started bombing them in return, dropping bombs on London or dropping uh, bombs on Berlin. You couldn't, you couldn't separate, you're gonna have it. From here on out, there is no non-combatant. Everybody's in it. In history, no one ever remembers the number two man. Who was your co-pilot and whatever happened to him? Well, the man that flew with me as, as co-pilot was Bob Lewis. The man that flew the second airplane to Nagasaki was Charles Sweeney from Boston. Bob Lewis, unfortunately, he didn't want to stay in the, in the military service. He had things, better things to do back in New Jersey, and which he did. He went back and he, re, he got out of the military service and went back. and. Unfortunately, in about five years' time or six years' time, he suffered a heart attack and died. Uh, Charles Sweeney, I've been asked that question before. I know Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon, but I don't know who was the second. I mean, it's that simple. Every, everything seems to be based on first. But uh, those guys at Nagasaki, I mean, in the boxcar were really needed. All right, the Smithsonian. One question, we can get it. Uh, the Smithsonian is beginning a search for a new director of the National Air and Space Museum. In your opinion, what are the most important credentials that the ideal candidate should bring to this position? Well, number one, which they did not have, they did not have a, a uh, military or an aviation-oriented person, nor did they have a trained uh, museum curator uh, in any place in the Air and Space Museum that I heard of, and I've heard of a lot of no places for it to be. Uh, those things are utterly important. That man has to also be a historian, and he's got to have somebody on his staff that knows something about it, because the first one of the so-called uh, offerings, the exhibit proposed, 500 and some odd pages, I think I'm correct in telling you that within the part that concerned the 509th composite group alone, there were something over 200 inaccuracies, and those inaccuracies were in historical fact and technical fact. So somebody's got to be there that knows what they're talking about, that's all I can say. All right, thank you. Uh, before we get to our...
Thank you. Before we get to our final question, a couple of gifts. First, a certificate of appreciation for being with us today. Secondly, a famous National Press Club mug to keep you uh, filled with coffee and awake uh, during all your travels uh, uh, during this 50th anniversary Thank you. year. I'm, I'm a very hippie coffee tr drinker, and I appreciate both of these things. It's been a pleasure to be here. Sorry I mumbled too long. Well, we have one final question now. Uh, <laughs> have you ever met a survivor of Hiroshima? And if so, tell us what the meeting was like. Well, I met I can't remember, I can't pronounce his name, but anyway, yes. At one time here in Washington, when the peace uh, movement from Hiroshima was over here, they were soliciting uh, money, they were soliciting sympathy, and so forth. And I would have to tell you most honestly, I got, I got, should we say, maneuvered into a position I had to meet the man. And when I met him, he grabbed a hold of my hand, wouldn't let me go, had all kinds of photographers there taking pictures. I didn't invite it. Now, I'm sorry that those things had to happen, but they did. And I don't have any sympathy today because of it. I, I don't, I've never had a sleepless night. <laughs> thank you, General Tibbetts, for being with us, and we thank you in the audience for joining us today. Our program is over. Good afternoon.